What I would like to do is, uh, is talk about uh, the eradication strategy that DEFRA wants to um, put together. Um, and let's talk us about towards eradication because eradication is actually a very difficult thing to achieve. And it's about the science underlying the policy because uh, we need to make policies evidence-based uh, and so we want to drive the policies through the evidence. So this is trying to uh, summarise um, what the evidence is for the TB eradication strategy that DEFRA is putting together. As a starter, however, I'd just like to take some, uh, to pr produce some, some take-home messages. Um, first of all, we know that TB is spreading as it, and is increasing and actually is out of control in, in England uh, and in Wales. Uh, we have current controls that have high impact but are not enough. Um, TB needs to be controlled in both cattle and wildlife in order for it to, us to achieve our objectives. We also know that the status quo is really not acceptable and we need to be able to change things because uh, otherwise we won't get the disease under control. Um, we have considerable future financial and economic and possibly health costs if we actually don't do anything about the disease. Um, we need to implement additional controls in order to achieve our objectives and we have actually very strong evidence for um, uh, badgers in particular as being a main wildlife host for uh, bovine tuberculosis uh, and also the fact that reducing badger numbers uh, can reduce the disease in cattle as well as, as, well as badgers. Um, and reducing the wildlife host is essential as a component of disease control. We know that from a number of uh, uh, lines of evidence, which I'll come to in a little while. Um, there are also no easy fixes for bovine tuberculosis. It's a very complex disease. It's fiendishly complex. So even vaccination is not going to be the silver bullet. Nevertheless, we do want to develop vaccines if we can. Um, the new control strategy that we're putting in place needs to use all the available measures that we have. Um, uh, uh, and, and that's a whole, uh, whole system of, of measures uh, rather than just one uh, particular control measure. Um, and controlling badgers is uh, unfortunately an essential part of that uh, Boeing TB control strategy. So what I'd like to do is t just take, take you through the rationale um, behind uh, those, those key messages. So if we look at, first of all, at the status of bovine tuberculosis and the scale of the problem that we have in the UK um, relative to our other um, uh, European partners, this diagram simply shows this uh, in a, a sort of almost a pie diagram form, uh, but it's the size of the dot that gives you the scale of the problem. So, you know, in Southern Europe and Central Europe, uh, they do have a TB problem, but it's small compared with ours, and they have a formal TB-free status within the European system and within the global system. Uh, Ireland has a TB problem that's not quite as um, large as ours, and actually Ireland uh, is getting their TB problem under control. In the UK, we have the biggest TB problem in Europe, um, probably the biggest TB problem in any uh, developed country in the world uh, and it's going in the wrong direction. So that's the kind of scale of the problem. If we then look at the history of bovine tuberculosis, um, it's a history about us gaining control and then losing control. Uh, what this shows is a timeline right the way through from 1956 to almost the present day. Um, and this shows the numbers of reactor cattle um, in the herds, and this is reactors per thousand tests. The, the actual uh, identity of the lines doesn't matter too much here, it's the pattern that matters. Uh, and the pattern is that um, by about the early 1980s, early mid-1980s, we had bovine tuberculosis under control. And this happened because of cattle testing, because of taking cattle out of herds and controlling um, uh, cattle movement. But something happened in the 1980s to change that situation and uh, uh, bovine tuberculosis started to take off again. Uh, about 2001 we had foot and mouth disease which stopped our capacity to, um, uh, to test for bovine tuberculosis in cattle herds uh, temporarily just for, for one year and you can see uh, bovine tuberculosis um, jumped very substantially during that period of time and that gives you an idea of the amount we're able to keep a lid on the disease just from standard cattle testing. 
after foot and mouth disease uh, um, uh, abated and we were able to start testing again, the curve uh, went back onto its original trajectory uh, but never came back down to its original level. The reasons for that are something that one can debate. We've got a pretty good idea why that has happened, but it's not something I'm going to go into here. The main point is the trajectory is upwards and it's keeping going upwards and we need to do something about that. So that's the overall picture, but what about the geographical picture? Well, this shows um, the outbreaks of bovine tuberculosis in the UK and the red dots from 1986 when we had pretty much the disease under control all the way through to 2010 where basically we've lost control of the disease. And the disease is concentrated in the southwest, um, the west of England and southwest of England, um, and it's marching eastwards and northwards all the time and it's becoming more intense in the high TB areas as well. So again, we need to do something about this, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. So there's a geographical spread of bovine tuberculosis. Scotland, by the way, is TB free, but it won't stay TB free uh, if this process continues and we don't do something about it. So one of my jobs as Chief Scientific Advisor is to think about what the reasonable worst case uh, might be. And that reasonable worst case is what I call status quo. In other words, if we just do things that we're doing at the moment and continue doing them. What will happen under those circumstances, there's fairly high certainty that we'll have an increasing incidence of disease. And this is the incidence that we get um, from a model that's projecting forward from the present day through to about 2050. Um, and it shows an incidence going from um, uh, just, be just between two and 3,000 uh, um, annual observations uh, up to uh, over 12,000 in that period of time. So it's a very large increase in the disease. We'd have increasing cost of disease and that the cost would become unaffordable. And again, here's a cost model that is based on this that shows a, a continuously increasing cost from around about £100 million a year that it costs us to uh, what it will, would be in, in current money terms, uh, about £450 million in about 2050. We'd also have a TB, a TB, uh, uh, a TB would be endemic um, and uncontrolled. Now, what do I mean by endemic? I mean that it would be um, throughout the countryside um, and it would get into a lot of species other than just cattle uh, and, and badgers. We'd have increasing pressure from the European Commission as well. We are already under, Euro under pressure from the European Commission. I showed you the diagram earlier on um, that said we had the worst problem in the European uh, system. Uh, so the European Commission quite rightly wants us to get that under control. And if we don't get it under control, we'll find uh, we have greater and greater trouble actually marketing our livestock products within the European system. Slightly more speculatively, we'll see livestock industry decline. It's very expensive for farmers when they get TB and many of them are on the edge of uh, um, not being, being able to um, keep their, their farms going. So the more TB we get, the more farmers will see, see going out of business potentially. TB in wildlife may well occur. Now, we know that it occurs in badgers, but we also know that it occur occurs occasionally in deer and foxes uh, and possibly other species as well. Um, so we'll probably see an increase in, in uh, uh, TB and other wildlife species, so they'll start, start to suffer as well. Uh, we'll have TB and other livestock. We already see TB uh, getting into sheep. Um, llamas, for example, are extremely uh, um, susceptible to TB. Um, so I think we'll see TB spreading into other livestock species as well. But almost more importantly is that we'll see TB getting into domestic pets. And that's actually very worrying, because domestic pets um, cohabit with us. And as a result of that, we'll start to see TB in people. So we'll start to see human disease developing um, if we don't keep it under control. So that's, that's slightly speculative, but many of these things are likely to come about to some extent. And the conclusion is that the current direction of travel is not really desirable. So we have to try to do something about it. So. What can we do in response to, uh, to this, this worsening situation? How can we control the disease? 
Well, we have five measures that we can put in place. We have uh, containment. We can try and um, box the disease in to particular geographical areas. We have uh, intensive testing of cattle in particular and removal of cattle. We have biosecurity measures to try and keep cattle that are infected away from other cattle that are uninfected, but also keep cattle away from badgers um, uh, as well, so that we can keep the sources of infection and the susceptible animals apart. We have potential for vaccination, and we also have wildlife control. And we have to use all of these measures uh, simultaneously um, in different mixtures for different circumstances, but we have to apply them all uh, pretty rigorously in order to be able to get control of this difficult disease. So if I look at the first of these, containment, um, what we intend to do is to take um, England and Wales uh, uh, and to um, uh, allocate um, certain uh, regions. So we've got areas where TB doesn't really occur uh, very much at all now, which could be designated as formally TB free under the European rules uh, and we'd like to keep it that way. So we'd like to stop the transfer of tuberculosis into the, from these high, high areas into these lower areas. We also have edge areas where TB is currently spreading. So this is the spread of TB into new areas and what we'd like to do is stop the spread. So we'd have a certain policy um, of measures or set of measures that we'd actually put into the, to, to the edge area. And then we have the core TB areas where we get very high incidence of TB and what we have to do is to try and use all the tools we have in the toolbox in order to be able to uh, get TB under control in these areas. So these are the high risk areas, we'd have aggressive intervention and we use all those tools that we have available to us. So that's containment. Let's move on to intensive testing now. We, last year, we did 5.5 million tests in, in, in cattle in, in England, um, a, a very large number, so that gives an idea of the kind of uh, effort that already goes into this, and this is our main control measure um, at the moment. Uh, we have routine surveillance of all herds in the high TB areas. Uh, every herd gets tested every year. In the lower TB areas, um, it's, it's less frequent, it's about every four years or so. Um, we have, uh, after, after a herd has been tested, if, if we get a reactor, we uh, then retest the herd to make sure that we are uh, getting as, 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 as well-defined a, a view of the position as possible uh, using something called gamma interferon. We also have slaughterhouse surveillance so that when animals go to slaughter, uh, we are able to be, say whether they have TB or not, and if they have TB, we can trace that back to farms as well. There's issues like pre-movement, testing, uh, we make sure that any animals that uh, uh, are from a herd that uh, uh, potentially has, has TB um, or, or comes from the high density areas uh, will be tested before it's moved. So there are a number of these sorts of measures in place um, and all of these are what keeps a lid on the disease at the moment. But one of the interesting things about how the disease manifests itself is that what we are seeing is a pattern of disease which suggests we've got multiple local epidemics going on. And we get this from the genetics of the disease. There's small variation in the genetics of the bacterium that's involved, uh, my, myobacterium bovis. Um, and those small variations show us that there are many epidemics that occur around the country. Now those mini epidemics uh, tell us quite a lot because cattle, for example, are moved quite a lot around the, the whole of this um, uh, high TB area. And if it was cattle that was moving the M. bovis around, you'd see a smearing of all the genetic signals across uh, the region. Uh, instead, what we're seeing is quite localised genetic signals, and that suggests to us that actually the M. bovis is quite locally uh, acquired, and there's, that's a, that gives us a pointer to the fact that M. bovis may well be coming from local wildlife um, in, the, in the regions uh, uh, where cattle get infected. So that's intensive testing. It tells us quite a lot about how the, the biology of, uh, of the bacterium works, but it also keeps a lid on the disease. Let's turn to biosecurity now. 
Uh, biosecurity is about how we keep the infected animals away from susceptible animals. Well, we already have removal of infected animals uh, uh, and strict movement controls on, on, on cattle. Um, when we get, uh, we had, uh, we removed 28,000 uh, uh, animals from uh, uh, from England last year for slaughter as a result of positive TB tests. Uh, and under some circumstances, when herds get uh, uh, repeated TB outbreaks, the whole of the herd is slaughtered. Uh, so that's a that's a very extreme case, but the but the but it's the only way to clear TB uh, from a herd after it gets repeated breakdowns. Um, we also have measures to separate badgers and cattle. So if cattle are kept indoors, then badger exclusion is put in uh, around the sheds and we try to keep badgers out of the, the feed troughs and that sort of thing. So there are, there are measures that uh, farmers can put in place in order to keep the, the separation between cattle and badgers. Uh, and there are also measures to make sure that we're uh, not, uh, as much as possible, not mixing infected cattle with uh, cattle that are un uninfected. So let's now look at uh, vaccination. So vaccination, um, the uh, principal vaccine that we have available to us is called BCG. Um, it's one that many people are familiar with and uh, I, you know, I've been uh, injected with BCG but it's going to take us about 10 years to develop a BCG vaccine for cattle. Uh, there are good reasons why we haven't got uh, a BCG vaccine for cattle. Uh, it's because we cannot um, distinguish between, until recently at least, we haven't been able to distinguish between a, an animal that has been injected with vaccine or that ha really does have TB. Uh, and we now have a method to be able to do that. Uh, but it's, I, as I said, it's going to take 10 years to get uh, the, the licensing for BCG vaccine put in place. Um, we're also working to um, uh, identify new candidate vaccines all the time, uh, but that's a very difficult thing to do. We don't even have a high quality uh, vaccine for human tuberculosis. Um, we need to uh, develop oral vaccines, particularly for badgers, if we possibly can, but it's more than five years off before we're going to be able to do that. And it may be you know, quite a lot longer than five years. Uh, we have no way of being able to predict when we're going to get that oral vaccine so that we can put it in food for badgers um, uh, and deliver it to them through the countryside uh, to be able to reduce the uh, probability of badgers having uh, tuberculosis. Now, many people are, are aware that we have an injectable um, vaccine uh, for badgers. It has a number of problems because it, it requires a disproportionately large investment to be able to use that on a very large scale. So it's two to three times more expensive than, than culling badgers, for example. Um, and each badger needs to be vaccinated every year. So uh, that means that the cost-benefit trade-off is even worse. Um, it doesn't eliminate uh, infection from infected badgers as well. So it can reduce the spreading of the disease by infected badgers to some extent, but it certainly doesn't um, cure them of the disease. Um, and it will take a longer to have an effect on TB in cattle, um, almost certainly, than, um, than, than some of the other methods, and particularly culling. Um, and it's not been demonstrated to have effect. So we have more evidence for culling than we do uh, for injectable uh, badger vaccines. So if we can now move to wildlife control, and when I say wildlife, in this case we really are talking mainly about badgers, because badgers are a very um, uh, robust host for bovine tuberculosis. Bovine tuberculosis does cause disease in badgers, but badgers tend not to die of bovine tuberculosis very quickly. So they're able to spread it around a lot, and they spread it around amongst themselves and amongst cattle and, and other, other livestock as well. Um, up to 50% of cattle um, uh, infections are probably caused um, by badgers, or around 50%. Um, we know that there's control of uh, the controlling that wildlife reservoir uh, from experience with uh, in New Zealand, and Australia, and the United States, uh, and also to some extent Ireland, um, does have an effect uh, on reducing TB in cattle. Um, we, there's a complex dynamic cycle between badgers and cattle in terms of TB. We don't know how the transmission actually occurs. It probably occurs by many different routes, um, but it's very difficult to pin down how that transmission occurs. 
Um, but what we do know is that um, removal of badgers, if done uh, at sufficient scale, can actually have a downward pressure on bovine tuberculosis in cattle and in badgers. Um, and uh, injectable vaccine um, is licensed and available, as I've said, um, but uh, it's not really as cost effective as controlling wildlife by uh, removal and reducing densities. So if we next look at the evidence base for the effects of removing wildlife and removing badgers particularly on bovine tuberculosis, this is a slightly complex diagram. but. Um, Part of the evidence, there are really two lines of evidence. One comes from something called the randomized badger culling trial, the RBCT trial. Another one comes from comparisons with other countries that have um, uh, tried to control tuberculosis, and I'll come back onto that in a minute. But this is a diagram of the basic results from the randomized um, badger culling uh, trial. Uh, and it shows that badgers, uh, uh, that culling badgers, has a lasting significant benefit in terms of reducing uh, tuberculosis. Just to take you through this, um, after a period of culling of, of four years, um, the, if you look, follow the black line during that period of time, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 basically the, the, the number of outbreaks or the index of the number of outbreaks has declined. Um, uh, thereafter, that number of outbreaks stays much lower uh, and eventually uh, moves back up towards um, the, the, the number that there was uh, before any culling uh, started. And basically, after about four years, uh, there was, in this case, about a 50% reduction in bovine tuberculosis in cattle. Um, but averaged over this full period of time, um, it's about maybe 16% or so is the reduction. The brown line shows uh, what happens in the surrounding areas. And this is one of the contentious issues around culling badgers is that you get something called a perturbation effect that perhaps causes increase in TB around the area where um, badgers have been culled. But what you would notice is that while culling is going on, you get a perturbation effect. As soon as culling stops, actually, you get a slight net benefit um, during the, uh, the early years, and then it goes back to uh, being, uh, being pretty normal um, in the surrounding areas. Um, so what we've done is designed the culls around trying to make sure that those perturbations are actually minimal. The next line of evidence is what's happened elsewhere. Um, and this is quite compelling. In Australia, uh, Australia is basically has eradicated uh, tuberculosis uh, by removing the wildlife source of tuberculosis, which is, um, uh, in that case, buffalo. New Zealand, shown here, shows the, the occurrence of tuberculosis in the diagram here. Um, and it shows, up to 2013, a rapid decline in the number of herds um, with tuberculosis. And this shows the amount of money spent on removal of wildlife in this case, possums uh, in New Zealand. Uh, so basically, as you put more effort into removing wildlife that have, uh, have the disease, the wildlife reservoir, um, the disease comes down. Uh, the same story is emerging in Ireland, and in Ireland, badgers are also the problem. Uh, and there's a nice case control study here between Ireland, the Irish Republic, and, and Northern Ireland, because the only difference between them is that in the Irish Republic, they cull badgers, and in Northern Ireland, they don't. Uh, so if we look at the Northern Ireland situation here, and the Irish Republic situation, this difference is probably because of the culling of badgers. So there's lessons here. Uh, the lessons are that you have to control the wildlife reservoir in order to be able to um, control uh, uh, bovine tuberculosis. And another lesson, particularly from Australia and New Zealand, is that if you transfer control of the, the disease control process to, uh, to the industry, to the farming industry, then you get a, very, um, uh, you get an a farming industry that's very engaged with it and uh, uh, it's very successful at the end of the day. So what's the payoff? Well, the payoff is that we protect the health and well-being of the public. Um, we maintain public confidence in food safety and the countryside. 
We meet international um, obligations. I explained that about the EU earlier on and legal commitments. We maintain the UK's reputation for safe and high quality food. We protect and promote the health and welfare of animals. These animals that are suffering from TB um, um, are not uh, well animals, they're not healthy animals. Um, we maintain productive and sustainable farming industries um, and we reduce the costs of TB to farmers and to the taxpayers uh, because we're going to, uh, it's going to cost us, if we go on the way we are, it's going to cost us about a billion pounds over the next 10 years to control TB. There are a number of um, uh, legal instruments as to why we need to control TB um, uh, and, and those are detailed here. So what's the strategy going to look like? Well, the strategy will contain all the tools we have in the toolbox. Here's a list of all the tools. Some of them will be brought to bear on controlling TB in cattle. Um, some of them will be brought to bear on controlling TB in non-bovine non farm animals like, uh, uh, like sheep and pigs. Um, and then we'll have other sort of cross-cutting activities. Uh, but some will also be um, uh, uh, brought to bear on uh, controlling TB in wildlife. Um, so the objective is to achieve TB free status which is a less than 0.1% prevalence of TB in cattle herds um, by about 2025-2030. Um, we'll use all the, t all the available tools, I've talked about them, containment, surveillance, testing, etc. But wildlife control is part of that. But I include vaccination within wildlife control because it's not just about culling animals, it's about controlling TB within wildlife. And in some cases, vaccination will be the right thing to do. Um, so we've got to try and design the control measures, the set of control measures around the circumstances that we're presented with. Uh, so the tools will be applied di differently depending on circumstances. So why a badger cull uh, and why a pilot? Well, um, we know that culling is, if, is effective as a, a, a basis upon which to control um, uh, uh, TB. We know that from the randomised badger control, uh, culling trial, which I talked about earlier on, and the comparison with other countries. We want to turn that science into uh, the science of experiments into an operational management tool. And that's why we're carrying out these, cu these cull pilots. Um, and we want to test culling as a tool um, to, to control TB. Um, so the, but, the, but I think an important thing is, and, and, and what I want to repeat again, is that badger culling alone will not eradicate TB. We know that. We, we will not eradicate um, um, TB by just culling badgers. But it does present us with a, 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 a very potent method within the, within the context of all the other methods we have. And we know that without controlling the wildlife reservoir, we cannot control uh, bovine tuberculosis. Um, so how will the cull be carried out? Well, um, we must again see this as part of that wider strategy, uh, the cattle testing, biosecurity, vaccination eventually. Um, Natural England will be issuing licenses to cull companies that will carry out the culls. Uh, there are strict license criteria about the areas that must be used and the areas are set so that it, it reduces minimizes this perturbation effect um, and most of the land within that area must be accessible for culling. Uh, we also require that they take out uh, a very large proportion of the badgers in that area and again that's to reduce the effects of, of perturbation. Um, so we want to be very precautionary about this uh, so uh, we're starting out with just two areas we're testing to see whether we can apply uh, uh, best practice control measures using uh, free shooting in particular in those areas and the, uh, the, the effectiveness, humaneness and safety of the, uh, the method will be assessed by an independent panel uh, of experts who will then report to the Secretary of State. So, uh, as, as, as a form of risk mitigation, we've got best practice guidance uh, being given to, uh, uh, being used in the field and all those who are involved in the culling will be trained and they're, they're, there will be professional oversight as well. Um, so what the ultimate um, uh, output from this will be that a decision will be made in about 20, uh, um, uh, 20, February 2014 as to whether we want to continue uh, with this method um, into the future. So that's it for, uh, for that uh, lecture on 
why we want to eradicate TB and how we're going to eradicate TB, and I hope it's been helpful. Thank you.